Welcome to the Alexander Hamilton Institute's continuing education course for the spring semester of 2018. Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan, the making of an American century. I'm Dr. David Frisk, a PhD in political science, a resident fellow at the Alexander Hamilton Institute since 2013. Among my main activities here is to teach the HI's free classes for the general public, which cover themes in history, social science, and political thought. These courses have become very popular in our area. Over 40 people are in the current class, and two of the ones in recent years have been even larger. The courses have ranged from, most recently, Abraham Lincoln, to the culture and politics of the 1960s, to the processes and strategies of presidential elections, to the historical roots of America's red-blue divide, to modern statesmanship and leadership. They're held in our headquarters building here in Clinton, New York. Our class on Roosevelt and Reagan began at the end of January and will continue until May 7th. The recording you're about to hear is not a live lecture, but a later taping under quieter circumstances. We plan to make a recording such as this one of each lecture at the rate of one per week. Each lecture will be recorded uh, for about 30 minutes, uh, that were 30 minutes in length. And we cordially hope that you will enjoy these lectures and find them educationally rewarding. I'll say more in later lectures about the similarities and, of course, the contrast between Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan and about the concept of uh, the phrase in our title, the American century, a term that came into use shortly before the United States' entry into World War II and that refers to its already growing prestige, power, and responsibilities on the international stage. But to begin with, in our first lecture, the main point to be made for now about joining Roosevelt and Reagan in a single course is that both of these presidents had a major influence on what America is, even in our time, both internally and in world affairs. In addition, each represents to many people in the two political halves of America today an ideal kind of national leadership and policy orientation. In certain respects, their leadership styles, as well as, of course, their policy positions and political ideologies are in stark contrast to one another. In other respects, there are significant similarities. Our purpose in this class is to look at both presidents objectively and with open minds. It focuses almost entirely on the Roosevelt and Reagan presidencies, since there is much to cover in them. But the first week on each of them will deal with their early years and pre-presidential careers. In our final week, we will directly compare and contrast the two presidents. On occasion, we will do this briefly at other points as well. A brief note on our readings. The class is reading part of two major biographies, Gene Edward Smith's FDR, that's the entire title, and Lou Cannon's President Reagan, The Role of a Lifetime. In most weeks, we'll also have a selection from another more specialized book that goes into more detail on the week's topic or provides a different perspective. My comments will often refer to these biographies and other books and occasionally to other writings about Roosevelt and Reagan that are not on the reading list. This first lecture will go up to just short of Roosevelt's governorship of New York State, which was from 1929 through 1932. The 1932 presidential campaign and the first several months of the FDR presidency or the New Deal will be our main topic next week with some prefatory material about Roosevelt in the 1920s. The most fundamental point about Franklin Delano Roosevelt's upbringing for the purpose of understanding his presidency and perhaps also understanding his effectiveness as president is probably the degree to which he was part of the American upper class of the time. The sophistication and the social capital, as we would now call it, the high-level connections and experiences to which he was exposed and upon which he could draw as a young man and later, were remarkable. When his father James died in 1900 during Franklin's freshman year at Harvard, he left an estate worth almost $14 million in today's money. But that was just one example of young Franklin Roosevelt's advantages. James Roosevelt, a Harvard Law School graduate, worked briefly as a lawyer, but was mainly an investor, especially in the coal and railroad industries. FDR's mother, born Sarah Delano, had a stronger personality and exerted more influence on her son than the father had or did. And she would, incidentally, live until well into his 12 years as president. The heritage of Sarah's family was, in Smith's words, every bit as grand, much richer, and far more accomplished than the Roosevelt's. Some of her ancestors went back to the Mayflower. On the paternal side of Franklin's family, his great-great-grandfather Isaac Roosevelt helped to draft the first constitution for New York State and was part of Alexander Hamilton's Federalist or pro-constitution faction at the state's ratifying convention. 
He also co-founded the Bank of New York with Hamilton and served as its president for five years. Franklin Roosevelt, the only child of James and Sarah Roosevelt, was born in 1882. The electric light, the telephone, and the automobile were invented within a decade after his birth. America was a rising, rapidly industrializing nation, but increasingly subject to socioeconomic stresses and strains. Progressivism and then populism, or really populism first and then progressivism, we'll have more to say in future lectures about these topics and Franklin Roosevelt's relationship to them, would become powerful political forces in the early decades of his life. Young Franklin was raised by governesses and taught by tutors. Among the subjects he learned were Latin, French, and German. He lived according to a strictly regulated schedule as a boy and had few playmates. Travel, Smith writes, was an integral part of FDR's childhood. His parents visited Washington, D.C. in 1887 in order to get congressional and presidential support for attempts to construct a canal across Nicaragua rather than Panama. James Roosevelt had been a generous contributor to President Cleveland's 1884 presidential campaign and his previous campaign for governor of New York. On this extended visit to Washington, the family visited the White House several times. On one of these occasions, the president said to five-year-old Franklin, My little man, I am making a strange wish for you. It is that you may never be president of the United States. A decade and a half later, on a ten-week vacation with his mother in Europe after his first year at Harvard, uh, Franklin and Sarah visited the German Emperor Wilhelm II, or Kaiser Wilhelm, as Americans would know him in the First World War, who invited them aboard his yacht while they were on a cruise near the Arctic Circle. The family also visited Europe each year and spent the summers at Campobello, an island off the easternmost part of Maine, where Franklin learned to sail. At age nine, he attended school for the first time in Germany. At 14, on another visit to Germany, the now 14-year-old boy cycled through the country with his tutor. Franklin knew the language well enough and was brazen enough to talk his way out of fines for traffic violations. He was taken by his parents to the classic performance of Wagner's Ring Cycle Operas at Bayreuth, and his mother reported to her sister, Franklin really appreciated it far more than I thought he would. He was most attentive and rapt during the long acts, and always sorry to leave, never for a moment bored or tired. A key stage in Roosevelt's upbringing was his attendance at Groton, a recently founded prep school near Boston. The rigorous environment, aimed at cultivating what was called manly Christian character, was Spartan, the opposite, that is, of luxurious or self-indulgent, and was dominated by the school's formidable headmaster, the Reverend Endicott Peabody, who expected the most out of the 110 boys in residence there, placing an especially high value on character training, religious faith, and athletics. The demanding Peabody, whom Roosevelt would look up to as something of a father figure and mentor, even decades later as president, evaluated young Franklin as a, quote, quiet, satisfactory boy of more than ordinary intelligence, end quote, although not academically brilliant. Athletically, Peabody noted, he was too slight or small in size for success. We all liked him. Franklin then attended Harvard, where he concentrated mainly on economics, government, and history classes, recalling of the economics courses later when he was president. I took economics courses in college for four years, and everything I was taught was wrong. Franklin became the editor of the student paper, the Harvard Crimson. While a college student, he attended the coming out party for Alice Roosevelt, the daughter of his distant cousin, President Theodore Roosevelt, at the White House. As biographer Smith reports, FDR spent three crowded days in Washington attending formal dinners, a reception at the Austrian embassy, and the dance itself held in the East Room. There was also tea with cousin Theodore and a second private talk with the president. At Harvard that semester, there was scarcely a weekend when he was not attending a dinner or a party somewhere in the Boston area. Before his wedding to his distant cousin Eleanor, the couple attended Theodore Roosevelt's re-inauguration as president in 1905. Franklin and Eleanor sat just behind the president as he made his inaugural speech. They then went to lunch with the president in the White House, watched the inaugural parade with him, and of course attended the inaugural ball. Later, on a second honeymoon between his first and second year of law school, Franklin and Eleanor spent more than three months in Europe. Upon their return, his mother Sarah built a Manhattan townhouse just for the young couple off Park Avenue. A few years later, she gave them a second house, 34 rooms and three stories, at Campobello on the Maine coast as what she called a belated wedding gift. Franklin entered Columbia Law School in 1904, a year after graduating from Harvard, 
Some of our presidents with legal training, such as Lincoln, Calvin Coolidge, and Richard Nixon, have had truly legal minds. That was not the case with Roosevelt, who made only modest efforts as a student at the law school. He was then admitted to the New York Bar without finishing law school, and soon joined a prominent firm in the city, Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn, which specialized in corporate clients. A Harvard classmate who worked there with Franklin remembered later that, quote, he intended to run for office at the first opportunity, and that he wanted to be and thought he had a real chance to be president. Young Roosevelt outlined his plan. First, he would be elected to the state assembly, then appointed assistant secretary of the Navy, an office his cousin Teddy had held, and then governor of New York. And that is more or less just what happened. Roosevelt's first political opportunity arose in 1910, a good democratic year, since it was a midterm election during the politically troubled presidency of William Howard Taft, Theodore Roosevelt's chosen successor, but a president who, rightly or wrongly, became a great disappointment to TR and many of his admirers in the left wing in the left-leaning or progressive wing of the Republican Party. The Republicans had also held the White House by that point for almost 14 consecutive years in an era when demands for various reforms in American government as well as in our economy and society had become increasingly strong in many quarters. In Roosevelt's native Hudson River Valley, local Democratic leaders wanted a good candidate to replace the retiring Democratic assemblyman from the Democratic town of Poughkeepsie. There was some concern about whether the popular recent ex-president would say anything negative about Franklin. But Teddy urged through a relative that he should go ahead if he wished. When it turned out that the Democratic Assemblyman wished to run for another term after all, Franklin willingly agreed to run for the state Senate. That was a very different proposition. He would have to defeat a Republican incumbent and win Republican rural areas to do so. Franklin campaigned in what was then a new way, by automobile, in the three-county district. Cars in rural areas were required to not only yield to farm carts with horses, but stop the engine as well when they encountered them. Farmers were pleased that young Roosevelt actually did so, and he used these opportunities to chat up the men who were driving the horses. He campaigned enthusiastically and intensively in the rural areas, speaking to any small audience he could find. On one occasion, he reportedly talked with a group of Italian immigrant working men he ran into using a combination of the French and Latin he had learned. The campaign was lighter on issues than one might expect of a politician who later redefined the Democratic Party. And to some extent, this continued during Roosevelt's brief career in the state Senate. Taking advantage of a split between progressive and more standard Republicans in the GOP, he campaigned against political bosses in both parties and associated himself with the former president, Teddy Roosevelt, in that respect. Roosevelt won narrowly, and he had indeed run well in rural parts of the Republican district. His ability to appeal across party lines, therefore, long predated the Great Depression and the demands for more government that emerged from it. Roosevelt was not comfortable with the New York City machine Democrats at the time, and they seemed to have been even less comfortable with him. One of their state senators, Big Tim Sullivan, made this comment to friends upon learning that Franklin had been elected to the legislature. If we've caught a Roosevelt, he said, we'd better take him down and drop him off the dock. The Roosevelts run true to form, and this kid is likely to do for us what the colonel, ex-president Theodore, is going to do for the Republican Party, split it wide open. As it turned out, something like that did happen to the Democrats eventually during the FDR presidency. Roosevelt was not well-liked in his two legislative years in Albany, 1911 and 1912. His future Secretary of Labor, the social reform advocate Francis Perkins, who was already a fixture in New York state politics, recalled that he really didn't like people very much and had, quote, a youthful lack of humility, a streak of self-righteousness. And even she added a deafness to ordinary people's hopes, fears, and aspirations. In the wake of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York City, young Roosevelt apparently had no involvement in the legislation offered in response to it. Indeed, Perkins would recall this as his reaction to her request for his support on the bill to limit the work week for women and children to 54 hours, also known as the 54 hours bill. No, no, more important things. More important things. Can't do it now. Can't do it now. Much more important things. Roosevelt and one of his closest political associates, Lewis Howe, later misrepresented his involvement in the issue, claiming he had worked for the key bill. 
On the question of prohibition, a major issue at the time, the cautious Roosevelt maintained what was called a dry voting record as a legislator that the Anti-Saloon League considered perfect, reflecting his views among rural constituents, although he didn't believe in prohibition. He did, however, show real interest in conservation. He chaired the Forestry, Fish, and Game Committee in the State Senate and tried, among other efforts on such issues, to pass a law drastically limiting timber harvests, especially out of concern for the Adirondack region. Roosevelt's first connection to national politics occurred in 1911, when he ambitiously took the initiative to see the newly elected governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was considered a likely candidate for president for what we would now call the liberal, or then the progressive wing, of the Democratic Party. Roosevelt worked for Wilson at the Democrat statewide convention in 1912 with little success. But he didn't give up, organizing a team that functioned as a kind of alternative to the official New York State delegation at the national convention. The message of Roosevelt and his allies was that Wilson, as a progressive candidate, was the key to carrying New York State in the general election. In those days, New York was considered, at least by some people in politics, to be essential if the Democratic Party was to win the White House. Roosevelt enjoyed that year's National Democratic Convention in Baltimore, where he campaigned hard for Wilson. Although he had little impact on Wilson's nomination, he made a good friend and very important contact there. Josephus Daniels, editor of the Raleigh News and Observer in North Carolina, and the Democratic National Committeeman from the state under whom he would serve in the Wilson administration, beginning less than a year later. It was in his 1912 campaign for re-election to the state Senate that Roosevelt developed his alliance with the campaign strategist and tactician Lewis Howe, who was then an Albany reporter for the New York Herald, who took on the leadership of that campaign. Howe's approach in the campaign was to promise anything that would win votes for his candidate. Roosevelt was re-elected, but soon joined the newly elected President Wilson's administration. Josephus Daniels had no real qualifications to be Secretary of the Navy, but, like much of Wilson's cabinet, was appointed for political reasons as an important Wilson supporter in the South. Daniels chose Roosevelt as his deputy partly because he was simply from another region than himself. Roosevelt's service throughout nearly all of Wilson's eight-year presidency taught him major lessons in national-level politics. As a member of the Wilson administration, Francis Perkins later observed, Roosevelt noted Wilson's personal difficulties with the politicians, his remoteness and isolation from them. It was really in Washington during these years that FDR, Perkins said, learned to be a politician. Located in what was later called the Old Executive Office Building, now the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, next to the White House, and was then the combined headquarters of the State War and Navy Departments, Roosevelt worked in an environment that was particularly hard to administer. Unlike the Army under Secretary of War Elihu Root in the Theodore Roosevelt administration, the Navy hadn't yet been brought up to date in organizational terms. In a word, it was highly decentralized and really under the control of Congress rather than the President or his appointees. The Assistant Secretary's position, like any bureaucratic position, had a limited scope of official authority, but Roosevelt disregarded that. In a memoir published many years later, Daniels would quote him as saying of the Assistant Secretaryship, I get my fingers into just about everything, and there's no law against it. Daniels, a Southern populist and a morally rigorous man, who might well have fired young Roosevelt if he had known of his affair a few years later with Washington socialite Lucy Mercer, was not only a hard worker and shrewd at the interpersonal side of politics and government work, but also a rebel who suspected that his admirals were ill-informed in regard to whatever they were telling him. The only man whom Roosevelt ever, at any time in his life, had as a boss or supervisor, Daniels was one of the Wilson cabinet's most left-leaning members, along with the president's first secretary of state, William Jennings Bryan. He had previously served as the publicity director for Bryan's three presidential campaigns and agreed with him on opposition to big business and other special interests. Daniels was oriented not toward building up the Navy in those years. It was then ranked third in the world, but had many outdated ships, nearly as much as he was concerned with reforming it, and also seeing to the sailors' welfare. Among his priorities was breaking down the barriers between the enlisted men and their officers. His assistant secretary, Roosevelt, was quite sympathetic to this, even to the point of supporting Daniels' banning of wine in naval wardrooms on the grounds that officers shouldn't have it since it was unavailable to the men. Another major influence on the pre-presidential Roosevelt was the aforementioned Lewis Howe, his aggressive and shrewd political counselor from New York State, 
who joined him at the Navy Department. As he would be during FDR's first years as president, Howe was a valuable aide whose, quote, mordant sense of humor, distrust of piety, and biting cynicism, in biographer Smith's words, all appealed to Roosevelt. The combined efforts and examples of Joseph S. Daniels and Lewis Howe taught him about national politics and the workings of the National Democratic Party. It was also during these years in Washington that he learned the importance which politicians place on small favors and public gestures that make them look good. As Assistant Secretary, Roosevelt became known, usefully, as a friend to organized labor. Many in that movement became his lifelong friends and supporters. He also learned, as I've suggested, about dealing with Congress. He tried to grant requests for favors that members of Congress passed along from constituents, requests for promotion, early discharge, and the like. As president, he would later recall that congressmen most wanted, quote, a nice, jolly understanding of their problems. A little patronage, a lot of pleasure, and public signs of friendship and prestige. That's what makes a political leader secure with his people, and that is what he wants anyhow. In 1917, shortly after America entered World War I, British merchant shipping, on which Britain depended for food, was sinking to the bottom of the sea as a result of German submarine warfare. Roosevelt, perhaps because he f spoke French well, was tapped to meet with the French side of the Anglo-French mission that came to America, including its military hero, Marshal Joseph Joffre, when they landed on American soil. In intensive talks with the high-level British and French visitors, Roosevelt urged the Allies to, to call for the largest possible amount of assistance from the United States. And although he was not authorized to do so, Roosevelt promised to provide Britain with 30 American destroyers, which were provided. He was also instrumental in laying a line of anti-submarine mines in the North Sea, even though it was a violation of international law and despite the fact that the U.S. had previously protested against placement of mines in the sea by the Germans and the British. Under pressure from Roosevelt, the Navy developed a mine that was more suitable to this operation. The reluctant British were prevailed upon to accept the plan. Roosevelt's position on the League of Nations in the years immediately after World War I offers yet another significant insight into his early pragmatism and get-it-done spirit. He did not oppose the reservations or proposed changes to the League of Nations portions of the peace treaty that were offered by the powerful Republican Senator Henry Cabot Lodge and wanted Wilson to make what many regarded as these relatively small compromises so the Republican-controlled Senate would agree to the U.S. joining the League. Wilson, of course, famously did not agree to those changes. Roosevelt's pragmatism, and in this case prudence, are also evident in his refusal to run for the Senate against a Republican incumbent from New York State in 1920 when he feared correctly that it would be a strongly Republican year. His first national campaign, however, was nonetheless in that same year, 1920, when he was on the Democratic ticket for vice president. An old Harvard friend urged that he run for vice president if the Democrats nominated a candidate who might actually hold the presidency for them in 1920, European Food Relief Administrator Herbert Hoover. Roosevelt was impressed by Hoover, saying, I wish we could make him president. There could not be a better one. Hoover, who was a longtime Republican, although from the progressive wing of the party, refused the approaches from the Democrats, but Roosevelt was nonetheless chosen for vice president. The ticket was headed by Ohio Governor James Cox, who chose Roosevelt because, quote, his name is good, he's right geographically, and he's anti-Tammany, that is anti-Tammany Hall, the New York City Democratic machine. The deal could have been killed by Tammany leader Charles Murphy in those days of boss-dominated national conventions, but Murphy felt that Cox was the only Democratic nominee for president who had ever shown him respect and therefore approved the choice. Roosevelt campaigned very energetically for the ticket, giving nearly a thousand prepared speeches, setting a record at the time for campaign intensity among candidates for national office. Watching brief footage from the 1920 campaign on YouTube, it's striking to see him as a tall, lean, youthful, and not yet disabled young man. A year later, in the summer of 1921, he was stricken with polio. It was a serious case, although not as bad as it could have been and was for some victims. A few years later, in 1924, Roosevelt learned of a place called Warm Springs in Georgia that had mineral waters many visitors had found therapeutic. Roosevelt purchased the expensive property from a friend who had previously bought it, and he entrepreneurially and idealistically proceeded to turn it into a therapy center for his fellow polio victims, a project into which he put great effort. 
as he did his own exercises in the pool to build up a considerable upper body strength. His wife, Eleanor, about whom, incidentally, there will be more in some of our future lectures, was apparently alienated by the rigid racial segregation and harsh poverty of rural Georgia when she visited the site. But Franklin took a broader view of his surroundings. He became well known among the area's residents, including the poor farmers, whose hard lives he not only observed sympathetically, but learned about, and with whom he talked about crops and livestock. A local farmer later remarked, he was a man that could talk to you. He had sense enough to talk to a man who didn't have any education, and he'd sense enough to talk to the best educated man in the world, and he was easy to talk to. He could talk about anything. The other major development in Roosevelt's life in the 1920s was his nominating speeches and other support for New York Governor Al Smith, the, quote, happy warrior of the Democratic Party, a term Roosevelt didn't coin and was indeed initially skeptical of as sounding too literary for political purposes, but that was lastingly attached to Smith by one of the speeches Roosevelt gave for him. In both 1924 and 1928, Roosevelt sang Smith's praises at the Democratic National Convention. In our first lecture, we have discussed Roosevelt's upbringing, youth, and most of his pre-presidential career. Our next lecture will briefly cover the remainder of his pre-presidential career up through 1932, including his governorship of New York State, before turning to its main subject, the first months of the New Deal. Thanks for listening.